Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Yonit Behar, and I'm the Associate Curator at the Paul Art Museum. I will be presenting tonight's program, a conversation with the curators of Remaking the Exceptional, Amber Ginsberg and Aaron Hughes, moderated by the Paul's professor, Dr. Christina Rivers. This program is sponsored in part by the Posen Center Human Rights Lab at the University of Chicago, which supports innovative interdisciplinary teaching and research initiatives that critically explore the theory and practice of global human rights. The exhibition, Remaking the Exceptional, Tracing Torture, Justice and Reparations, opened at DPM over a month ago and will, be, and will remain open until August 7. So please visit us if you are in Chicago. Since 2009, Chicago-based artists Amber Ginsberg and Aaron Hughes have collaborated on the Tea Project, a going series of tea ceremony performances and installations inspired by the elaborate etchings made in, on styrofoam cups by detainees at Guantanamo Bay. This exhibition brings together artworks by former and current detainees from Chicago and abroad, new works by contemporary artists and collectives working at the intersection of aesthetics and politics. There is an accompanying publication that will be available starting in June. Um, and today's program will be um, as follows. Amber and Aaron will tell you uh, more about the exhibition. Then they will be joined by Professor Christina Rivers for a conversation. And finally, there will be time for a Q&A. So we welcome your questions in the chat and please feel free to write us um, over there. Now, let me introduce you to our speakers. Amber Ginsberg is a Chicago-based artist teaching at the University of Chicago in the Department of Visual Arts. She creates site-generated projects and social sculptures that insert historical scenarios into present-day situations, as well as engages present-day histories to imagine alternative futures. She often works with long-term and ongoing collaborators, and together they engage multiple communities and elicit working relationships with experts in the fields of biology, activism, legal scholarship, and speculative fiction. Erin Hughes is an artist, curator, organizer, teacher, anti-war activist, and Iraq war veteran. Working through an interdisciplinary practice rooted in drawing and printmaking, he works collaboratively to create meaning out of trauma, transform systems of oppression, and seek liberation. Hughes works with a range of art and activist groups, including Just Seats Artists Cooperative, Emerging Veteran Art Movement, and Prison Neighborhood Art Education Project. Christina Rivers is an Associate Professor of Political Science at DePaul University. She is the author of the Congressional Black Caucus, Minority Voting Rights, and the US Supreme Court, and has written about ballot access for pretrial detainees, felony disenfranchisement laws, and prison-based gerrymanders. She co-wrote a state law that mandates voter and civic education as part of the exit process from Illinois Department of Correction. She has collaborated on a bill to enhance college programming for those inca incarcerated in Illinois and volunteers to provide registration and voter access to citizens detained at Cook County Jail. She has also taught at Stateville Prison as part of DePaul's Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. Now I welcome Amber and Erin to begin their presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Yonit. Um, we'd like to start by just naming those who are contributing to the exhibition and the publication. But of course, I would like to start by thanking my collaborator, Erin Hughes, who I always continue to learn from. Contributing artists include Abdu Malik Abad, Mansoura Daifi, Jamal Azme, Mohammed Ansi, Ghalib Al-Bahani, Dorothy Burge, Chicago Torture Justice Memorials, Debbie Cornwall, 
Asad Harun Gull, Mashan Ali Hendricks, The Invisible Institute, Damon Locks, Lucky Pierre, Trevor Paglin, Prison and Neighborhood Arts Education Project, Khalid Kasim, Sabri Mohammed Al Karashi, Martin Whitehead, Monica Trinidad, Ahmed Badr Rabani, and Sarah G. Ree. Um, this exhibition and project and collaboration and podcast have been informed with interviews with Anthony Holmes, Mozambique, Kilroy Watkins, Mohamedou Olslahi, Ronnie Kitchen, Sabri Al Karashi. Latanya Jennifer Sublet and Mansoura Daifi. And there are many more people that contribute to the exhibition and publication, including Tara Betts, Devon Terrell, Michael Sullivan, Robert Curry, Daryl Fair, um, Eric Blackman, Aliyah Hussein, Audrey Petty, Mark Volkoff, and so many, many more. And there's also so many organizations that collaborated on this project and uh, on the exhibition, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials, Chicago Torture Justice Center, Prison and Neighborhood Arts Education Project, CAGE, People's Law Office, Witness Against Torture, Heart, Reprieve, The Invisible Institute, Medill School for Journalism at Northwestern University, and importantly, this program is sponsored by the Posen Center. We also just want to thank our, uh, the DePaul Art Museum and the amazing support that we've received from Laura Caroline, Unit, and David, and all the students that work at the institution. It's been an honor you know, to work with you all and to learn and grow with all of these collaborators over the last years as we've been building toward this exhibition. Welcome. I'd like to start this evening with a quote from uh, Guantanamo torture survivor Mansour Adafi. Guantanamo is not exceptional. Injustice can be anywhere within a prison, in a family, in a country, in a system, or even within, even within individuals. So Aaron and I are gonna kind of guide you through the gallery. I think some of you have been there and others perhaps not, um, but just to set the stage for our conversation with Christina, we're just gonna walk through each of the galleries. So upon entering the first floor gallery, the first thing that you would see would be a quilt by Dorothy Burge with a very striking um, portrait and a name. And this is a series of quilts that moves into gallery one, where there are also a wall of names, um, which is an incomplete list of all of the John Burge torture survivors, together with portraits sh um, shown from behind in a series that, that Debbie Cornwall has done of former Guantanamo torture survivors that are now um, in countries all over the world, talking about really this first room is about portraiture, who gets named, how important it is to be named, and also those that perhaps aren't, can't yet be seen. So stepping from gallery one into gallery two, um, this uh, idea of naming is uh, repeated through the 780 porcelain teacups that are displayed in the exhibition, each featuring the name of one person that has been or is still currently imprisoned at Guantanamo. And um, those cups are based on the story of um, in, at Guantanamo in the initial stages of the prison 2002 through 2006. Uh, individuals in prison there weren't allowed to have anything in their cells, nothing at all. But each day at the end of the day after dinner, they were given a styrofoam cup of tea. And this styrofoam cup became a canvas to express themselves. And so they begin to write and draw and scrawl all over these cups. And the military considered these cups because of that a security threat. And so they would come and confiscate them, bring the them to military intelligence to analyze, and then throw them away. 
And it was a, a very absurd process that if someone was going to scrawl a message and throw it into the ocean, it was going to get to somebody somewhere somehow. It was a little bit crazy. And every time people would pick up these cups, they would realize that they would just be scrawled all over with flowers. And so this gesture of creativity, despite all of the institutional dehumanization, this reaffirmation of individuals' humanity, uh, despite the institutions that they're within, is what this exhibition is trying to lift up, is trying to hold the contradictions between the violence and the resistance. In this, in this same gallery are um, images of ships at sea, all painted from within Guantanamo. And one of the Guantanamo survivors, Sabri al Karashi, he says, at Guantanamo, depending on the place where I was, I could see and smell and hear the sea. And for me, the sea was a symbol of freedom. Also in this room are these beautiful, beautiful paintings of candles by Halit Kasim, who painted them inside of Guantanamo where he still is incarcerated extra legally. And there, there are nine of them, one for each person that has died while imprisoned in Guantanamo. There's also a massive installation in the middle that features all the interconnections between the way tea, tea is a habit that is embraced and taken in. It's a habit that is a part of colonialism and it's a habit that's a part of solidarity. And this installation lifts up the way that these habits transverse and move around the world, whether that's the movement of torture practices from Chicago to Guantanamo, to Abu Ghraib, to Bagram, and back to Chicago or New York, and then back to Guantanamo, or that's resistance movements from Chicago to Afghanistan to the UK. And so lifting up all of these spaces and the work between these two sides of, um, of, the, of this history. Entering into gallery three, you're met with a series of paintings of trees, dead trees, most still standing, often in beautiful, vibrant colors. And this um, metaphor of the dead tree really became um, sort of emblematic and a part of our curatorial um, theme when we read Ralph Lawrence's torture letters. And throughout the whole book, Lawrence is taking 20 years of research on John Burge and torture in Chicago. And he uses the metaphor of the torture tree. And he says that the, the torture tree, the trunk is the use of force of continuum, uh, con the use of force continuum. The branches are the officers that perpetrate the acts of use of force. And every leaf is the individual incidents of the use of force. So in this room, there's also um, new research uh, from Myra Kwaja at the Invincible Institute on the relationship between the military to prison and prison to military um, pipeline in terms of how officers enter into forces, uh, police forces, and they take leaves and go um, in the military and then return connected also with use of force complaints. So kind of new research tracking the relationship of the inflow and outflow from the Chicago Police Department. Stepping back through this gallery, you um, into the uh, gallery two, you see the torture tree that um, is knocked down and cut down. And that's a reflection of both acknowledgement of this history, but also aspirations for a different history that is then repeated as you walk outside with Lucky Pierre's amazing installation of a timeline um, that's mirrored or across the hall is a quote by Carl Williams, a uh, Chicago police torture survivor in which he says, you can change the concrete, you can dig up the soil, but the history is still there. It is always in the air. And so acknowledging these histories while also imagining alternative futures is how we like to think as we move into this second floor and the second floor galleries. 
I was had the great pleasure of being um, in the gallery when Carl saw that quote and he read it out loud and then turned around with a big, enormous smile and said, that's me. Um, and so it's been really powerful that so many survivors have been able to come and see the words that we learn so much from. And as you go, as Aaron said, as you go upstairs to the second um, gallery, it's really this resistance room, which is framed by um, another uh, saying by Mansour Adafi from another a Guantanamo torture survivor. The arts in general are a very important, a soul language. It can be a form of resistance, a form of love, communication, history. And together with that is Mahamudu Odslahi, also a Guantanamo torture survivor um, in big letters in that room. Any expression with drawing, with poetry, with a speech, with an article is an act of peaceful resistance. And so you enter into this room and there is an entire wall of Sarah G. Ree photographs who has, she's been documenting Chicago resistance for more than a decade. And this, the vibrancy of the way that people show up here is really captured in those photographs together with a multi-year project with the prison neighborhoods and art project um, who, that teach inside Stateville with the express mission to bring that work outside to families, to all of us. And this is a, a series of classes that imagined if you took all the population of the US carceral system and the, and the budget that accompanies that system, you would be both larger than a state and larger than some small countries. And so really imagining a state beyond the states that we have. And it's an expression of statecraft through banners, dances, music, all different forms, together with Damon Locks, who was also teaches in that program, but took that assignment up himself and um, created these nine new works for the exhibition, uh, himself imagining what this 51st free state can be. Um, also in this room is the amazing collaboration between Jamal Azmi and Deborah Cornwall, in which uh, Debbie's photographs from Guantanamo are, are spoken back to by Jamal. Um, Debbie brought those photographs to Jamal um, where he's been released and um, he then graffitied them and wrote into them. And in many ways, they're, um, they're humorous satire, sat, uh, satires on the state of Guantanamo. And that whole ability to speak back to these institutions is really essential. Also, speaking back to those institutions and lifting up this idea of alternative futures, we step into the, um, the back gallery. And in that room is bookmarked uh, both sides, bookend by both sides, by these two speculative reparations ordinance. One is by the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials and Joy Mogul. And that is just the speculative reparations for John Birch torture survivors that then became law in Chicago. And Chicago was the first city in the country that passed the reparations ordinance for racially motivated police violence. And although that reparations ordinance is not perfect in any way, it is something that we can build from and learn from and a step that in building a craft of reparations and taking on this idea of that craft of reparations and exploring these themes um, is the a speculative reparations ordinance for Guantanamo torture survivors. And within this bookends are the powerful drawings of Abu Zubaydah and Daryl Cannon of their torture. And a big part of, as, as we've interviewed all these torture survivors and talked to them over the last years, you know, a major part of the work is acknowledging the truth of what has happened and that people don't believe them. And so these documents become their way to tell the truth as they become court testimonies. These graphic uh, images, which we were very unsure about showing, but showed because of the encouragement of Abu Zubaydah and of the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials, um, they're, um, 
um, responded to by the beautiful work by Gala Balbahani of these two legs touching and embracing that he made when he was inside um, Guantanamo and more works by Hala Tassim about imagining his home from Guantanamo in Yemen and other surreal uh, imaginations of tea and loss and connection that is found in his beautiful, powerful pieces. Building on this idea of craft and reparation, we step into the final hall where we're greeted by Mashan, Mashan's installation. Mashan Al Bahani, uh, sorry, mixing up names. Um, uh, Mashan Ali Hendricks um, has been spending over a decade uh, working with Resolution 194, which was, uh, and doing restorative justice work generally for more than a decade. And House Resolution 194 was a very quiet apology that came out during the Obama administration um, less, less than 10 years ago, but he's been working with it since. And it is um, the first step towards um, accountability, which is the apology part. Um, it doesn't have any actual um, recompense or resolution, but also it's not very well known. And so he has taken this work and has done workshops, has written into a, a document that kind of explains that, and then very provocatively has written questions on the wall, which ask whether are we healed from slavery? Are we not healed from slavery? What would it take to be healed? This is an image that you're looking at where it was just the beginning. I was in the museum today and it's almost like completely chalked in. And people are really taking up these questions. Um, are white people healed from enslavement, from enslaving? And if not, what is needed in order to heal? And he's shifting perspective, asking questions and, um, you know, I think that there was a moment actually when um, Carl Williams, there's, this is the installation um, where Carl Williams came in and, and wrote on the wall and I sent a picture to Michonne and said, oh, you know, this is so amazing. You know, Carl, Carl wrote on here and he said, yeah, I know he texted me when he'd done it. So there's really a lot of connections between Chicago activists sort of throughout the museum that really hold the kind of curatorial premise, which is that um, we have been holding conversations over tea as a technology that is extremely slow, but what it does is it builds relationships. And so this exhibition is the works of um, former and current Guantanamo torture survivors, works that have been allowed to leave Guantanamo paintings, as well as organizations that have been fighting for justice and reparations um, in Chicago for over a decade. All right, is it my turn now? <laughs> I've actually been actively taking notes on, on what you're saying. So I was just, this is one of those things you get pulled completely into. Um, hello everyone. Um, again, my name is Christina Rivers. I teach here um, at DePaul in the political science department. I want to thank um, DPAM and everybody involved in this exhibit for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. Um, I'm really happy to see so many people here, um, especially some of my students, um, my colleagues on the planning committee uh, for a new project of, that DePaul is pulling together, the Institute for Restorative Educational Engagement. Um, and that includes Carl Williams, who's on that planning committee. So I smile each time I heard you say his name. Um, this, I'm happy to see folks here from PNAP. Um, I'm happy to see um, survivors who are here and their loved ones and their friends um, and loved ones and friends of survivors who are still not free. Um, and this includes some of the students that I'm working with at Stateville this quarter and with whom I have the privilege of working for the first time since 2020. Um, if, if you're not saying this to yourself already, just from looking at the images that Amber and Aaron were talking about, 
um, this exhibit really needs to be visited often. I've, I've come through twice and that's hardly enough. Um, I will definitely be coming back and I'm so glad that it will be here until August so that there's plenty of time for folks to come in and see and learn and, and become motivated by these really, really powerful, beautiful, um, painful, but beautiful images. I know for sure that I'm gonna be coming back more than once. Um, so I want to just, again, remind folks that this exhibit will be here for a while. And, and I'm so grateful that, that it's, DPAM is giving it such a long run here. Um, so I just have a few questions and I'm, I'm, you know, these are these kind of big questions that I'm hoping will generate good discussions afterwards. And Amber and Aaron, this is kind of a repeat question, but I still find myself asking this as, as you all spoke just now. If you could say, um, you know, tell us more about how you decided to structure this exhibit around, you know, an exhibit that's on torture, um, that's on kidnapping, around these themes of tea and of flowers and of the sea in, in the way that you did. You know, it's coming together more for me, and sometimes it's a little slow for these things to sink into my head. But if you could say more about how you sort of chose those particular themes, and and how. Um, you pull them together. And of course, there's a second part to this question. Um, I'm also curious about how uh, you chose whom to reach out to. How did you go about collaborating with the folks that you worked with um, and these survivors, especially since they're living in so many different parts of the world. Um, and because so many of those uh, survivors are inaccessible due to their incarceration or quasi incarceration. Um, well, I might start with the latter part of your question and just say that this whole exhibition is a culmination of over a decade of work and relationship building and time, you know, just really spending time and learning uh, different people's experiences. And, uh, you know, it began um, with uh began with a lot of veterans coming back that I was connected with that were speaking out against the war and tea became a way to to ground people that felt very disconnected from the global war on terror from the war in Iraq from the war in Afghanistan and find their way into having a conversation about how people here in the U.S. are completely impacted and having those conversations just led us directly into all the interconnections between the security state and the carceral state and the relationships that are often talked about as abstract connections or as like maybe um, concepts are actually people and you know they're people I, I served with uh, when I was in the military in Iraq a number of the people I served with worked in the Department of Corrections in Illinois. And um, kind of opening that space to kind of have this conversation to connect the struggles between what's happening here in Chicago, the amount of violence that the Black and Brown community has uh, been impacted by state violence and police violence and police torture, and connect that to the fact that those are many of these individuals involved with that are the same individuals literally, whether that's um, Richard Suley or John Burge or um, Greater X or the many other individuals that we've kind of identified through the different research that have actually been involved in violence in Bagram or Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo, and then also violence in these uh, local police departments and county sheriff departments. Um, through that work, we're also building connections with all these survivors over the years. And, you know, also the advocacy organizations, you know, um, that were involved. And that led us into finding people that we would have never been able to connect to, you know, and if it wasn't for Alice Kim and all of her work, we would have never connected with all the Chicago torture survivors. If it wasn't for all the work of the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials, we wouldn't have connected with everybody if it wasn't for the work of the Center for Constitutional Rights and the work of Mark Falkoff and Aliyah Hussain. You know, those are the individuals that brought us connect 
together and helped us connect up CAGE and their powerful work um, of as former survivors of Guantanamo. So building those relationships over the years is what brought this together. And we wanted to kind of bring that, those relationships into a space where people could see them and start to make, see those connections for themselves. Thank you, thank you. Amber? Yeah, um, you know, it's a nice introduction to, you know, Aaron setting the stage through conversations over tea because, you know, this project, um, he was doing this work and holding these conversations before I joined the project and thinking about these themes that are a little bit more material, um, the sea um, and the ships and the, and the flowers, you know, I entered this through material, through making the cups. Um, but there is something about making a cup and holding a person's name on the bottom of the cup. That person's name is, is a human. It's no longer a material. It's a, it's a connection to a system through which my government has you know, in prison, there are still 38 men, 20 years, 20 years who are not tried, they've not been convicted, and they're in Guantanamo. Um, and so, you know, how do you, how do you talk about and make that connections? And, you know, as, as artists, I think metaphor really helps bring those connections together. And so, um, you know, for the sea, we have these ships of the ships, images of the ships, and this dock in the sort of the kind of center of the museum. And you know, Mozambique, a Guantanamo torture survivor, talks about this in an interview we held, and I'm I'm going to quote him now: "The targeting of the prisoners in Guantanamo, there's no escaping. The majority were black and brown. And if you look at Americans' history, it's very easy." to demonize black people that were brought across the Americas in chains. So to bring us across the Atlantic in chains to Guantanamo was pretty easy. A large number of the, in, of the prisoners in Guantanamo are, were actually Africans. So when you compare that to what happened in Chicago, you see the targeting of black and brown people is systemical, is systemic, it's historical. It's something that America knows better than anyone else. So to have this dock and to have these ships and to recognize that the import and export of tea happened at at this time where there was also the legacy of slavery is to make these connections and habits even within the materials that are most comforting in our life. You know, I'm sitting here drinking a cup of tea, you know, to like, as a mode of calming myself to present to talk. It's also a history that um, the British army in India was twice as large as the British Army at home, because they were monocropping certain lands and using certain kinds of po certain populations for labor and instigating overseas armies to ensure commodities. These are our inheritances, these are our habits. And so when those images of those ships are so beautiful, and they also look very much like Turner's slave ship. You know, this is for Sabri, it's a form of escape, it's a form of thinking, but we also pass down sort of historical tropes, even in the objects that we choose to paint. So the dead trees and are a form of resistance, they're still standing, the flowers are this kind of incredible eternal spring in this gallery space that is the sort of resistance despite and the tea and the ships, they're all complicated. They're, they're neither one thing nor another. Thank you. You know, as, as you were answering the question and as I went back and, and looked at the museum, the exhibit for the second time, not the last time, um, and I had the great fortune of running into Dorothy Burge who is here with us. Um, and, and with John Ziegler, who was also here. Um, and we got to talking and, you know, as, as a black woman, when I see imagery of, of anything having to do with a ship and a boat and pain, you know, I go straight to 
uh, systems of chattel slavery that were largely global, right? And, and it, it's, it's where I go. Um, and so it was simultaneously so painful and yet so fulfilling to see this different connection made, right? Um, but Dorothy Burge and I both were struck by, um, you know, sort of, I don't want to make comparisons, but it invoked also these historical notions of, of lynching here. You know, I, I was sort of hearing the, the, the song Strange Fruit go through my head as I saw that tree, you know, that was on the ground. Um, and we were talking about um, these artifacts of, of flowers and, and your discussion of these artifacts of leaves just now. And, you know, my mind, our minds sort of went to the collections of soil um, at the Lynching Museum in Alabama, the collections of soil of, of, of where people have been historically documented to, to have been lynched, right? And you can see the different colors of that soil. It becomes this artistic installation, like a, almost a watercolor. Um, and so it's, it's a horrific connection, um, but it's a necessary one, I think, to, to get us to really thinking about this universality of, of just dehumanization. Um, from so many angles. Um, and I hope I'm not rambling, rambling with that because I'm still making these connections in my head as we're talking. Um, and so that leads me to the, the, the next question that I had is that um, I, I don't even wanna dare say what the most important message of this exhibit is because there's so many. Um, but one of the ones that really stood out the most to me is that this exhibit is, is that one of the key messages, many key messages is that uh, messages of this exhibit is that torture is far less about gaining information. It's primarily about dominance, um, either dominance by the state or by an individual or an individual acting on behalf of the state. Um, it's primarily about stripping people of their dignity, of their identity, and ultimately of their humanity. Um, so can you please tell us more about how you sought to ensure that this exhibit really illustrates those points along with illustrating individuals' resistance to and defiance of those dehumanizing efforts? I, for me, I, uh, I think it's that moment right there that you just highlight, highlighted that despite entire institutions, entire systems being designed to dehumanize people and take every every aspect of their humanity away, people still assert their humanity. They still make a mark, they still create, they still resist. And that just undermines the, in, these systems and any of the logic that is utilized to justify them just kind of crumbles in that moment of that gesture of carving on a cup or like Kilroy Watkins talked about, you know, folding over these um, milk cartons as he's waiting in isolation for his court case and creating these airplanes and finding all of his, you know, ways that he's surviving is also um, this creative outlet that's establishing meaning, creating connections, and um, creating these historical objects. They're all just, just rejecting any of the institutional's credibility and assumptions and logic that it can stand on, that it, it, it's rational in any kind of way, and that it's functional. And I think that's what um, why there's been such a reaction to the work in Guantanamo. Now there is no more work that's allowed, artwork that's allowed to come out of Guantanamo. It's completely forbidden. Um, so people are still allowed to create it, but they can't leave. And Hala Kasim has talked about how like that the fact that his work can't be seen is, is is devastating for him, but he's still creating. And just to me, you know, that fact that like a uh, gesture on a styrofoam cup became a security threat. You know, how, how, how that just highlights all of the contradictions that are imbued in these systems. And I think that's what we're trying to lift up. And, I, th I hope that we're able to point to these systems of violence through the resistance um, as a and lift up these amazing people's stories of struggle that I hope can also inspire other people to to do the same.
Yeah, I think it's um, so still surprising to me how threatened the state is by creative acts. There was an exhibition of works from Guantanamo torture survivors in 2007 called Ode to the Sea. And it was like kind of in a strange space, a little bit in a hallway, you know, like it, this was not like, you know, a huge fancy exhibit, but it got a lot of attention because the work is, was so striking. And in fact, it got so much in attention that, um, you know, as Aaron said, they're not letting any more works out of Guantanamo. So all the works that you see in the exhibition are 2007 or before. And um, the fact that people are reacting to these works and seeing the humanity of the, of the men who painted them is the fact that that is so functional. It's such a functional relationship as to be a threat. Um, it just speaks to the, the kind of power of communication between this difference of sort of standing, looking at a thing and thinking about the person who made it. It's always a person behind the artwork. Um, and, you know, it's going off of what Aaron said, there are men now who are refusing, their, you know, they're waiting for their release, but they're also saying they will not leave if they can't take their artworks with them. That's how closely connected they feel to them. Yeah, I'm just letting that one sink in there um, <laughs> for a minute. Um, it, it reminds me of a, a and there's some peanut people in here who can speak to this. Um, when I first started teaching at Stateville, I came in right at a moment when some of the decision makers there had decided not to let any artwork out of there. Um, there was an exhibit that had been planned and from what I understand, it was sort of interrupted at the last minute. And so there was a period where um, artwork couldn't come out. And as a new instructor, I remember being told, even if somebody wanted to illustrate something they were making on an assignment, something like that, that I probably would not be able to bring that out. Um, and I don't think that's the case anymore, but I found that so striking that, and that's, that's on a, a, a different level than what you're talking about here in, in Guantanamo, but it, it's, it's this great you know, example of how powerful art really is. Um, and so this kind of gets to my next question, and I'm asking this as somebody who, who does not have an artistic bone in her body that I have found yet. Um, so <laughs> um, if you could tell us sort of more about this, and, and you, I'm using these phrases that you all mentioned um, when I came and went through one of the earlier tours of this exhibit where you both uh, were there talking to us. And you told us about this sort of our, aesthetic, artistic intent. And I remember hearing this phrase, I think it was artistic intent and heartbeat um, of this exhibit um, and about survivors' creative gestures as modes of survival or of resistance or of resilience. And what we're hearing more today is, is really acts of defiance. Um, acts of humanization or acts that, that reject the dehumanization that is all about what's going on at Guantanamo or in our prisons and jails here. So you've started talking about that. If you could say more about that, that would be great. Um, I guess I, I like to think um, of art as a technology of freedom. And uh, a practice of freedom. Damon Lotz is this great uh, saying, uh, keep your mind free, that he's put on a number of pieces um, in reference to the individuals he and I or other PNAP folks have been working with at Stateville. And um, I think that that's a really important question for everyone. You know, what is the practice of freedom and what are the technologies of freedom? And I think that the PNAP project, the 51st Free State, is a great example of that. It's a great imagination of a free state. And uh, what artists in that project did um, was uh, 
based on you know years we had PNEP had done the long term project around long term incarceration, and that kind of morphed into a question of conversations around citizenship, and citizenship really prompted a lot of questions around belonging and human rights and connections. And um, from that emerged this idea of a 51st free state. If you took all the resources of the carceral system, all the people in the carceral system, and you just put it together that that is larger than most states. So what happens if you imagine that entire state as a free state? And these artists began to work on statecraft. They began to create anthems for their free state. And you know, with every anthem, you need um, you know a free state dance, and so they start creating dance steps, and then a stage for that free free state performance to be on, and then flags and emblems and symbols of liberation, and and all of that kind of became their ideas of what freedom is, and I feel like that work of imagining freedom is work that is for all of us, and I think the creative process is one of the one, one ways we have to kind of produce it, to create it, to find it. It's, um, I talk a lot, a lot of my work navigates questions of trauma and people talk about trauma as this cycle of disconnection and people re going over an experience over and over again because they didn't process it the first time and creating say something, making a mark can be a way to externalize that. Things that don't have language, things that we don't fully understand. And I think one of the things that we're all struggling with is a question of freedom and what it really means to be free. And so for me, art can be a practice of freedom. And that's a part of what we're trying to show is all of these amazing artists in the show and their profound commitment defining freedom and sharing it with us and letting us learn from that practice. Yeah, Aaron, I thank you. It's yes. And I think one of the incredible examples of that in the exhibition is, um, you know, even the law can be a space of creative imagining. Um, you know, the Chicago Justice Torture Memorials did a call um, for memorials for Birch, John Birch torture survivors. And Joey Mogul, you know, knowing the work of Standish Willis and the like decades long, decade long call he had for reparations for survivors, Joey created using legal language, the language of whereas, whereas this actually happened, whereas this happened at this place, whereas this happened at, um, at this time with these people. And then the language of um, hereby, we hereby offer, you know, uh, intergenerational education. We hereby offer reparations. A whole, it spells out and takes into account what the torture that happened and imagines recompense for that torture. And, um, you know, we had the great fortune of doing some programming with Joey and, you know, Joey was like, I never actually thought this would actually happen. But in 2015, it did happen. It came into law for the city council. And as Aaron said in the beginning, it's imperfect. And this and the fight isn't over once the gavel hits the hits the stage. You know, there's still struggles to get the funding for the center that was promised and to get the, you know, mental health and education that was promised, but it is a remarkable document in its imagination and its fruition. And we were really inspired by that. And so we worked with organizations who have been imagining and working with survivors in an intergenerational, um, you know, multilinguistic way for torture survivors, the Center for Constitutional Rights, Reprieve, CAGE, um, to make uh, imagined reparations for Chicago, for, uh, excuse me, for Guantanamo torture survivors. So these look at each other in the gallery, one coming, have one imagination coming to fruition and one imagination on its way to fruition. And I think 
you know, thinking about all the different ways that we can imagine the world includes all of our skills, wherever we are coming from. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to repeat two really great, what I'm going to call t-shirt phrases. You know, it's like, let's make the t-shirt now uh, that I will totally be using in class. So the three of you students who are here, you're going to hear this on Friday. Um, and one of them is art as the technology and practice of freedom. I love that. Um, I wish that that was the context that my art history teacher in class that I took 100 years ago, I, I wish that was in there. I would have probably done better in the course. Uh, but I really want to emphasize this notion of art as, as the technology and practice of freedom. I love that. Um, and Amber, your phrase that law can be a space of creative imagining. You know, I'm, I'm teaching this class at Stateville that in part is about law. I did not go to law school, so I'm still... Uh, I've studied a lot of it, didn't, can't say that I have JD. Uh, but one of the things we learn is that, you know, we tend to be taught law in a way that isn't, would technically be called creative, right? And yet, in my mind, some of the best laws that have, have been written have been, or changed, have been, have that's happened through very creative interpretations. Um, and so this notion of law being a space of creative imagining, that is definitely coming up in class on Friday, um, and I will attribute you um, and, and both of you. So thank you so much for that. Um, this kind of relates to, segues us into the last question. Um, and I'm gonna use another quote here that I learned when I was observing a wonderful colleague of mine, Susan Burgess, in a class, law class that she was teaching. Um, and she spoke of this um, phrase, uh, uh, that I believe was coined by Dean Spade. It's new to me, but I can't get this phrase out of my head, especially as it relates to this exhibit. Um, this notion of administratively impossible people. It, it's, it's a brutal term, um, but it's, boy, does it fit. Um, and it certainly fits a lot of the folks whose work is in this exhibit and this notion of this vulnerability of being in that imposed status where people who are administratively impossible in a status, that status has so often been imposed upon them. Whether people have been designated by the state as enemy combatants, whether they've been disappeared um, internationally or in the US, disappeared, coerced, and tortured here at places like Division II, Home and Square, other places that we probably haven't heard about or people don't believe. Um, so in, in light of that concept of administratively impossible people and, and working with folks who sort of don't fit classification, I can't forget the story that you told when, when I was there a couple of weeks ago about the person who has no country. And so you can't, it's even difficult to get work from this person because he, he doesn't exist in that particular way. Um, and that this is not uncommon, right? Um, so related to all of those problems, how does this exhibit, and, and just as importantly, how can those of us who are seeing it and who are gonna see it more than once, um, how can we share these truths and hold those in power accountable for such gross betrayals of humanity and of society? And so this question is aimed at you, but it's also aimed at the audience in general. So um, thank you for bringing up Sabri al Karashi's work. Um, Sabri is one of the most prolific, uh, was one of the most prolific artists at Guantanamo. And um, he's been transferred to Kazakhstan uh, where he has no family and no rights at all. He has no ID. He's not allowed to have an ID or any kind of state existence. He's not allowed to have uh, any form of bank accounts. And often, even when he spends time with making friends, that those friends are harassed and have even been jailed. So he's in a, living in a state of extreme isolation. And um, he's uh, still painting, though. He's making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of paintings. And we got the chance to interview him with the translation of Mansour Daifi, who is another Guantanamo torture survivor. And, um, you know, as we're interviewing him, he's pulling out painting after painting from the stack and these, these uh, boxes of paintings that he's been doing. It's over 300 paintings in the last, I think it was three or four years. And, you know, they're all beautiful, amazing paintings. And Amber and I were very hopeful 
knowing that many exhibitions include international work that we could just you know work with an international art handler and get this work over here and every step of the way it put more and more pressure on Sabri because of his lack of statehood and it really came down to the fact that in the end artwork can't leave Kazakhstan without proving who owns the work. Sabri can't prove he owns his own work because he doesn't have an ID. He can't prove he made his own work because he doesn't have an ID. He literally can't prove his own work that he makes with his own hand is his to share it in any kind of way with the rest of the world. And, you know, that is just one small little bit of, I think what you're talking about, these massive structures and bureaucracies that disappear people and invisibilize people and dehumanize people. And, you know, like we said earlier, yet they resist. And to me, the call to action is one that I think we continually try to take up. And it's a call of solidarity. It's a call to show up and be in solidarity with those most impacted. And let me tell you, it is a fraught practice as two white, um, rather privileged artists in Chicago. You know, we, we continually fail at this over and over and over again. And every step of the way, we're continually failing and learning and failing again and learning. And being able to accept how fraught that process is, and yet showing up again and again. And, you know, that's, I think, what we hope to share is that showing up and being in solidarity and showing up for Chicago Torture Justice Memorials. There's going to be a banner uh, march with the banners of all the individuals that have been uh, tortured by, by John Birch. There's going to be a walk from DePaul down to City Hall on the anniversary of the reparations ordinance, calling for the memorial to actually be built, calling for the reparations that the city promised to actually be realized. That's going to be May 6th. Um, and, uh, you know, sign the Center for Constitutional Rights, sign their petition, follow their listserv, follow CAGE, follow their work, follow the work of Chicago Torture Justice Memorials, get involved. And, you know, that, that question of like, what does it mean to, you know, I think of, I always think of Pauli Freire and his like comment about, you know, the oppressor, that's me. I have literally been in a country involved with an occupation that is the role i have taken up once they realize that they are the oppressor they may feel emotional psychological anguish but that does not mean that they are in a position with the solid they are not does not mean that they are in a position of solidarity and so what does it mean to actually show up and be in a position of solidarity and that is the work that i think we're trying to do through the art through the exhibitions through the practice and uh, we've been honored to that people have been generous enough people that have no reason to be generous to us have been generous enough to help us find our way into that position um i thank you aaron i won't add a lot to that question because i do want to open this up to the audience um, but I will say that, um, you know, showing up, yes, and um, learning, yes, and also being willing to take the time. You know, this is 10 years of conversations um, reverberating across each other in these six galleries. And, um, you know, we'll, we're gonna post links to everything um, in the chat, to everything that Erin mentioned. Um, and it can be overwhelming um, to this idea of, you know, sort of showing up. And I think that there's, two, there's a couple ways to show up. One is to really deeply be involved in something and stick with it. You know, we're working, we are, Erin and I are collective. We work with a lot of collectives in the exhibition. Working with people is slow and tumultuous and complicated and beautiful and effective and, you know, sort of all of those things. 
all of those things together. And so you can sign a letter, you can, you can kind of, um, I work sometimes with the Let Us Breathe Collective and Quamina always says, you know, you've got to find, you've got to find your way in. Um, and, you know, finding, finding her way in was finding her way into the garden um, and farming. Everybody sort of has a way in. And if you're really there, you'll end up showing up for other people also, you know, and it's just that showing up and figuring out, you know, what it is that you want to show up for um, and sticking with it. So, but I love the idea of opening this up. Um, I know that um, Yoni and David are going to post some of the links to the things that we we mentioned, but yeah, let's, let's see what folks have to say. Yeah, thank you. Um, the links that you've mentioned have been posted and I do see a question that's in the chat here. Um, for Christina, folks. would you like me to? Um, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah so thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to, before we go into the questions in the chat, which please feel free to keep writing them over there. Um, thank you to the three of you so much. And I will love to invite, as I usually do, to um, turn on your cameras if you would like to and feel comfortable too. And then we can change the settings to have the gallery view so um, we can see each other. And um, this is a question from Mark Delancey and has a question about two objects in the exhibition. Um, the first question is on the ground floor, there are spoons which occasionally have a tag stating that they have been returned. Could you explain what that means? And then um, the second question is about second floor sculpture, uh, most, which is the cardboard, it's Khalid's um, house of knowledge. Um, and could you talk about that object and the process by which it was allowed to leave Guantanamo? Um, I'll, I'll start, uh, we'll work backwards. Or I'll start with um, colleagues. Um, in the exhibition in the first room, there is the back of a painting and on the back of that painting, um, I learned a little bit about this from Mansoor, there's writing and a big stamp by the government that says approved by the US forces. Um, so the paintings that were painted inside Guantanamo, they go through a process um, for, uh, or they did, um, and they continue to even to be kept. So you could paint a painting, it goes through an evaluation, and if it isn't approved, it can be destroyed. Um, so even the question of whether one can or cannot keep the painting, but if they were approved for release before 2007, it's a, through a network of lawyers that we have all of this work. So there is lawyer client privilege and it's through um, the lawyers going to Guantanamo. That's even how the first kind of words from the men of Guantanamo, uh, some of the first creative words came out was through Mark Falkoff who edited a volume called Poems from Guantanamo where he collected poems that were then edited into a book. So it's always a lawyer client relationship but first it comes uh, with the question of approval for departure. Yes, um, in regards to the spoons and the tags and returned. So those cups um, with individuals' names on them don't belong to us. We made them, we made them based off the stories that we had learned about from Guantanamo survivors, from people that had served in Guantanamo but um, they have individuals' names on it and they belong to those individuals. And so we began a process of trying to return the cups to the people whose names are on the cups. And so um, just in 2019, I brought, uh, I believe it was nine cups to the UK and I distributed them with Cage um, and Mozambig, a torture survivor, and he, help distribute them to the other torture survivors, Guantanamo torture survivors in the UK. And um, I went to Afghanistan in 2015. And in some cases, we, some of the individuals that have been transferred out of Guantanamo have, um, some people were able to contact through their lawyers and able to find them and give them their cups and other people were not. And so 
Um, for those situations, uh, we even tried to return them at least to their communities. And so in 2015, I went to Kabul and I worked with the, bo the Border Free School and the Afghan Peace Volunteers. And they um, accepted the cups, 20 cups from Afghanistan, and they chose who those cups would go to and where they would go. They brought them to people that had survived incarceration in Afghanistan, you know, and survived torture uh, at the hands both of the current, at the time, the, the provisional government, others that had survived torture at the hands of the Taliban. And, you know, they were just, um, they, had, they had all different experiences with forms of violence and they were seeing this as a way of acknowledgement of the harms that they had experienced. And so that's what we mean by returns is, we feel like these cups don't belong to us. They belong to the communities and to the individuals whose names are on the cups. I'm just gonna add one little note that I, I learned and I and I had forgotten because um, Mansoor Adafi was on a tour with me on Sunday and I showed him the back of the painting because there's often writing on the back of the painting. And this is something that the detainees kind of play with a little. Once it's stamped, they get it back. And sometimes they write on the back, like post getting the release. And, you know, they know they can't write sort of too much or anything, but it is a little bit of a space of freedom in the same way that Debbie Cornwall and Jamal's work of kind of writing into Debbie's pictures, this kind of space of resistance turns out to be the backs of the painting or the backs of the sculpture, which you do also see on Colleen's House of Knowledge. I have a question um, in the meantime. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about your collaborative work. Um, you've been working together for over a decade and I'm very curious to hear how it has evolved and changed. How did you first start to work together um, and what led to remaking the exceptional? Okay, I'll go. <laughs> not it. Uh, no, uh, Amber and I met at Champaign-Urbana, um, not around the Tea Project. Um, uh, Amber had just uh, started to return to school uh, to study art at uh, Illinois State, and um, I had just returned from Iraq. And there was a community art space called Open Source Art that some grad students from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign had started. And I think both of us were looking for something beyond what was happening in the classroom. And that was the space that we got to engage with a broader conversation about what contemporary art was. And we began to curate and organize exhibitions together in that space. And that community uh, is still connected, you know, that, that, that group of, of individuals. And um, that I had, kind of, uh, I had returned to Iraq in 2009 as a civilian. I, there's a big story around that, but that had prompted my, um, the, the tea project and this idea of sharing tea um, as a really radical act, um, as a revolutionary act um, based off of what I had learned in Iraq and, um, and as a transformative act and uh, trying to share that in the States. and. Every time I was based off of, I was carving these styrofoam cups to pass out every time. And I was like, man, I can't do this every time. I got to come up with a system. And I was like, Amber makes these amazing porcelain and ceramic uh, materials. I should, we should get coffee. Let's talk about our projects. I wanted to learn. She was doing all these like tests, you know, making all these ordinances out of clay actually. And I was like, oh, this really overlaps with my questions about militarism and and so we got coffee and tea and we just started talking. Amber's like, oh yeah, casting 780 cups? No problem, we can do that in two weeks or something. I was like, great. <laughs> and here we are still working on it a decade later. So it was, it was just the, you know, it was just the beginning of a conversation and um, it, it's been a learning process every step of the way. We both start started in one place and we, this whole project, everything continuously is evolving and growing, and we are continually learning from each other. And I don't know, Amber. Now you gotta, you gotta add to that. 
I said LED yeah, I, stuff. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think Aaron and I are serial collaborators, right? Like we don't make a lot of work alone. Um, occasionally we each make a work alone, but we both have long-term ongoing collaborations. Um, and I think it speaks to, well, I'll speak for myself, but, you know, it, it really speaks to the benefits of um, really continuing and sticking with something. You know, I, I, I think of um, exhibitions as like moments or breaths or pauses in research as then things go on. Um, and I think Aaron really meets me, meets me and has always met me with that. And, um, and there's always a question of like, well, you know, what, what does this mean now, now that we've done this? Um, and I think we both really, we really share um, question. And, you know, I really came at this, um, you know, Aaron reached out to me, I had just been was thinking about this today, actually, I was doing a project called flower, um, which was um, the two kinds of like milled flower and the flowers sort of spelled together. Um, it was um, World War One terracotta dummy test bombs that were used to train pilots and they were filled with house flour and pilots in these like wooden planes would lean over with these basically terracotta vases and drop them to try to see a spot of white to train an aerial bombing, which then led to these, you know, I can think of our iconic images of war are sort of aerial bombs. Um, and this connection between domestic materials and war materials has been a kind of thread in my work for sort of many, many years. And I think we share that. There's something about trying to connect everyday acts, everyday materials, um, like this cup that I'm holding to really much larger systems. And um, for me, I can just say working with other people is there's a debate of what's gonna happen. When you're working with yourself, you just get to do whatever you want. And you, when you're working with someone else, you're accountable for the decisions that you make. And there is a back and forth and, a, and um, it's, it's, all, it's like sometimes almost feels like arguing. We're trying to really get clearer on how we think about a thing, how we feel about a thing. And I love that. We have a follow-up question from Mark Delancey. I also want to make sure that um, people are um, feeling comfortable writing. And if you're not, um, you can unmute yourself as well. Uh, but Mark has um, a follow-up question regarding the cups. And there's a note from a guard. It's on the label. Um, recalling a memory of the detainees inscribing the Cups, and this suggests a recognition on the part of the guards of the basic humanity of the detainees, something that the restriction on releasing artworks I expect is designed to counter. Do guards and detainees form relationships? Is there ever a desire to revisit such relationships on either side after a detainee has been released, or is that so difficult emotionally as to be impossible? Um, so that... <laughs> Oh. <laughs> go, go ahead, Amber. No, no, go ahead. This is what collaborating is like. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. This is a great question. And um, it's, I feel like it's a little bit of a lead in and a setup. But um, part of getting ready for this exhibition, Aaron and I interviewed four Chicago Guantanamo, uh, four Chicago torture survivors, four Guantanamo torture survivors. Some of the audio which you hear in the exhibition coming out of a big horn, but there's also a, a podcast uh, that we've developed, um, which, is, which is on our website. And in the podcast, um, many, many of the detainees, uh, many of the imprisoned men, um, speak about their relationships that they developed with guards. Um, and in some cases, um, Mozambique, you know, talks about the guards being his lifeline. They were actually the only people with whom he 
um, communicated. And I also think that, um, you know, Aaron, I know is gonna speak about his friend, Chris, but um, you're deployed kind of randomly where you are. And, um, you know, I do think that relationships develop and people, it isn't always so cut and dry um, that the people who are guarding um, folks have any contempt for them. And there's often deep respect for them and long-term relationships are made. And those relationships are, um, Muhammadu writes, Muhammadu Odslasi writes in his book at the end, correct me if I'm wrong, let's sit down and have a cup of tea together because we've learned so much from one another. And that has happened multiple times for Muhammadu where he has connected with former guards. Yeah, there's a, um, a doc documentary about that called My Brother's Keeper. Um, and the quote that you're referring to is by Chris Arendt. And, you know, there is these relationships built. And also there's a uh, still a question of accountability and relationships to power. And, you know, one thing why um, Chris Arendt is so important to me, not only as a friend, um, but he was one of the first former guards to speak out about the prison. He uh, testified at the Winter Soldier investigation hosted by Iraq veterans against the war about the inhumane and dehumanizing treatment of the people at Guantanamo in 2008. And that was before a lot of people were talking about the prison. Uh, legal advocacy organizations have been organizing around it, speaking about how injustice it was but there wasn't a lot of testimony about what was actually happening in the prison. And it was very slow to even find out who was at the prison. Um, and because of his outspoken efforts, CAGE, which was founded by Mozambique, a Guantanamo torture survivor, invited Chris to go to the UK and go on a speaking tour um, of the UK with them. And uh, there's this beautiful photograph from that tour of, um, um, Mozam and another survivor sitting with Chris talking about these styrofoam cups and carving cups. And, you know, that was one thing that they could reconnect around. And uh, so these connections do happen. But one of the things we kept hearing from torture survivors, is one of the foundational things that has to happen is acknowledgement. It's the acknowledgement of harm. And I think that that's what's so powerful about what Muhammad is saying. He's like, look, here is this, here's my truth acknowledge my truth and let's sit down and talk about it. And uh, I think that that's a big part of the work that veterans and service members that are involved and get implicated in these situations. And I would say overwhelmingly, it's very naively. It's without a deep historical understanding of, of these institutions. You know, uh, the people, most people that I know that join the military, they join it because they're trying to get out of their situation. They're trying to get ahead socially. They're trying to get a paycheck. And uh, they're trying to find some kind of way up the social ladder. And so often, you know, the individuals most impacted by institutional structural racism, by institutional violence, those are the same people that end up serving in the military. And often that, that kind of historical analysis, you know, of how our military is operated, how our empire has developed, isn't there? It wasn't there for me. You know, I didn't. I didn't know that. It wasn't until I was in Iraq, sitting there, realizing that everything I believed in and thought I understood about the world just collapsed in front of my face. <laughs> that I began to realize that there's a much larger, deeper history, and how much everything, how much things are rooted in dehumanization, in violence, and in racism. You know, those are things I just. I didn't really, and in greed, you know, those are things I didn't quite understand. And I think that that's a state that a lot of people that end up serving in Guantanamo or these other prisons. And for me, those individuals that then speak out and testify and tell their truth about it are really important. And same thing with the police officers. You know, there's very few police officers that have come forward and broken that code of silence, but it's essential for changing the systemic violence. It has to happen. And that, that is the work um, that I, I feel specifically motivated to do is creating space 
for individuals that in, that end up in these institutions to find their way, find their way to that position of solidarity. You know, like, what does it mean to find a way out of that and into a different position? I'm gonna jump in and answer Derek's question, which is, yes, it was. It continues to be incredibly difficult uh, and to settle on what to curate after so long, and and I and I just want to honor the museum. This is the most number of works and the greatest number of artists the museum has ever shown in one show, um, which is like just trying to like narrow down and hold hold that curatorial premise, um, you know, is massively difficult. And um, there's always, it's, there's always more that we wish that we could show. And um, I'll just say, um, for ourselves or for myself, um, you know, it was really this really focused on the longest term relationships that we had. So we first started speaking with the Center for Constitutional Rights like years ago, and we were able to interview um, Mansoor and Mozambique and Mohamedou because of those relationships. And we first showed work with Ghalib al-Bahani and Jamal Azme in Washington, DC, when Trump was being inaugurated. Um, and that was the first time that we were able to show with a Guantanamo survivor. And that just radically changed my view of our own work that it is, this work should be shown with their work. And then we really, when we started connecting the resistance movements to the resistance movements in Chicago, what are the longest relationships that we built? So it's in no way a retrospective of these connections broadly. Um, but yes, we would we always feel like we want to add new and things. And we also want that because we want to also change and grow. Thank you, Derek. Um, so I think we're about time for our last question um, from Nate, um, or it's more of a comment and about Sabri's work being stuck in Kazakhstan, and um, they're wondering if you can speak a, a little bit more about the work and show any images. So I'm going to pull up those images, the two works that actually uh, were not able to come to the exhibition, um, which is, I think, a really um, good way for the lack of a better word to end this conversation and, and perhaps hear from you, Erin and, and Amber about it. So I'm just gonna share those images now. These images are really remarkable. Um, one, because the US government let them out, um, you know, Aaron and I, when looking at um, many images, many paintings, these were these were the only ones that we saw of images of confinement, um, and so they they are remarkable paintings, and also it's remarkable that they were released. Um, and you know, the thing that I would add about this is, um, you know, what do you do when you can't show a work? Um, and so no one in the world would know that we couldn't get these images here um, if we didn't have empty frames in the gallery with text and a QR code. And um, as we were really realizing that there was in time for the opening. And I always say until these works get here, because we're still trying, this is not done. Um, we still are um, working to get works from Kazakhstan here. Um, 
is, you know, I was talking with a, I had a Danielle Wright was with me. We were just talking about this and like, what do you, what do you do? You know, Aaron and I were talking about this. What do you, what do we do? We could just not show them. No one would ever know, but to put the empty frames in the gallery and to, um, sh to really explain why they couldn't be here in some ways is just as much the work as the work itself. I think, you know, yeah, I don't have much to add on side of that. Sibri is an amazing painter and I hope everyone gets a chance. He has more work on Cage's website. And if you kind of hunt around the, uh, around the internet, you can find some more of his work. And I encourage people to, to look for it. Uh, Sabri Al Karashi, and um, you know, I hope that he gets to go home, um, that he gets to go see his family, because that's that's really what is on his mind. And um, you know, I also just you know, I know we're at time, so I just want to thank. I want to first start by thanking Amber. Um, it's been a really amazing journey. Uh, I can't believe that uh, we pulled this off, and I know a mass amount of that work um, and leadership has come from you to make this happen. So it's been an honor to get to work with you and kind of grow with you um, through these years. And Christina, it, I feel like we have so much more to talk about. I'm so honored to get to engage with you. Uh, I appreciate all your endless work. And, you know, I, it's not just a, you know, it's not just a theoretical thing. It's like these friends we have that are at Stateville that we care both deeply about. And I'm just honored to get to connect with you about that and that you're so deep in the struggle for their freedom is, um, I, yeah, I'm honored to get to be here in discussion with you. And I want to thank Uni and David and Laura Caroline for all the wonderful support. And of course, all the contributing artists because you know this I feel like none of this um, you know uh, singularly all this work is powerful but collectively it's transformative at least that's what I like to think and um, I'm honored that they were all willing to engage in this conversation and that we've had the privilege to show their work Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for joining. Thank you, Christina, Aaron, Amber. Thank you. Thank you. It was, this is, I'm so glad to have participated in this. Thank you. And come visit us at DPM. Definitely. More than once. <laughs> More than once. <laughs> have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. You too. To Bye -bye. be continued. Bye-bye.